our Educator Speaker Series, One Person Can Make a Difference with Pam Longabardi and Sean Tutron. My name is Tiffany Harris. I'm the Director of School Programs here at Crystal Bridges. It's an honor to welcome you tonight. This program would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors, Northern Trust. Thanks to Northern Trust for bringing this opportunity to our local and national audiences. Now I'd like to share the floor with my colleague, Kay Collier, to read our Indigenous Peoples Land Acknowledgement. As Crystal Bridges and the Momentary, we recognize our role as settlers and guests in the Northwest Arkansas region. We acknowledge the Caddo, Quapaw, and Osage, as well as the many Indigenous caretakers of this land and water. We appreciate the enduring influence of the vibrant, diverse and contemporary cultures of indigenous peoples. We are conscious of the role in colonization that museums have played. As cultural institutions, we have a responsibility to engage in the dismantling of historical and systemic invisibility of indigenous peoples past, present and future. We choose to intentionally hold ourselves accountable to appropriate conversation, representation, connection, and education to facilitate a space of measurable change. Thank you, Kay. I would now like to introduce our speakers for the evening, starting with Pam Longabardi. Pam Longabardi's parents, an ocean lifeguard and a Delaware State diving champion connected her from an early age to water. After discovering mountains of plastic on remote Hawaiian shores in 2006, she founded the Drifters Project, centralizing the artist as a cultural worker, activist, and researcher. Now, as a, now a global collaborative entity, Drifters Project has removed tens of thousands of pounds of materials from the natural environment and resituated it, it as a communicative social sculpture. Winner of the prestigious Hudgens Prize, Longabardi has been featured in National Geographic, Sierra Magazine, The Weather Channel, and in exhibitions around the world. She is, an, she is Oceanic Society's Artist in Nature and Distinguished Professor and newly named Regents Professor at Georgia State University. Please welcome, please join me in welcoming Pam. Our second speaker is Sean Tuton. Sean Tutan is a professor of English, director of Indigenous Studies, and a Fulbright College Master Researcher at the University of Arkansas. He is the author of Redland, Red Power, Grounding Knowledge in the American Indian Novel, Native American Literature, A Short Introduction, and numerous articles in literature and pedagogy. Tutan is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Please join me in welcoming Sean. A few quick notes before we begin. We encourage you to engage with us through the Q&A function via Zoom. If you're tuning in via Facebook Live, please add your comments to the section below the video. I also wanna make a note that transcription is available for the event at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So right now I'm gonna turn it over to Sean to kick us off with his presentation. Thank you, Tiffany. Welcome everyone. It's so nice to meet all of you, if, if only virtually, maybe in person someday. And <clears throat> I'm very happy to speak to you this evening. Uh, the title of my talk is Indigenous Worlds, Rethinking the Environment and Taking Everyday Action. And I gave a lot of thought to the subtitle. I wanted to find a way to speak on the importance of daily activity to make a difference in our planet. Well, we all know, or many of us, that it is in crisis. And I realize that it's very important for all of us to uh, do those good um, citizen activities such as recycling and being aware of uh, where our food come, comes from and the consequences of the uses of, of various uh, uh, disposable items. But I decided it's very important to maybe cut a bit deeper tonight. So I want to talk about our consciousness, our relationship to the planet, and provide avenues, perhaps, for a shift in that consciousness. It's something that I struggle with, 
And, uh, and I realize it's very difficult, but I'll offer some ideas tonight. Um, years ago, when I was drawn to indigenous studies, the study of the culture and literature of Native Americans, it wasn't because I am a member of the tribe. Rather, it was because I was fascinated with a very different worldview, one that I didn't always grow up with. And I saw in that different worldview, represented in volumes of literature by Native people, a very different conception of a human relationship to the planet. In fact, for some Native Americans, I soon learned, even a basket, thunder, rocks, have personhood and have an intrinsic right to live on this land, not only for their value in terms of exchange. And so that's what I dedicate my life to. It's become my passion, sometimes at the boredom of students. <laughs> but this is what I like to talk about, and this is what I'll spend my time on tonight. So I begin with four questions. What is wilderness? What is a human? What about spirituality and nature? And how should we value nature? The first two questions are, I wish you dismantled. These are questions designed to reconstruct some of our ideas. The latter two, I hope to open a conversation that might help us make that shift that I described in our consciousness and relationship with the planet. So the first question I begin with is, what is an indigenous concept of environment and how can we explain and protect the natural world? So the notion of the environment, itself uh, today seems rather politicized um, environmental activism. More and more you hear people speaking of ecology. But what are we talking about when we say there's that place out there, nature, wilderness, uh, the natural world? Uh, what are we talking about when we think of that place out there? Is it a place separate from ourselves? Uh, certainly we think when we say these terms, we think of relating to it, protecting it. But I have to say here that in my readings and my studies, and in my teaching, uh, the notion of the wilderness is a foreign concept to indigenous people, at least in pre-contact and early contact times. In fact, some native people in them writing their writings themselves have made a very clear statement on this. For example, Sioux Chief Luther Standing Bear, who knew a life uh, on the plains as a child where he had never seen a European American. Uh, it was a pre-contact life. Uh, in a time when buffalo were all the plains and he was trained in his from boyhood to do all the things that a young man should do, which would be to hunt for his people, to be uh, a good warrior, and to be uh, a good citizen and a good, good moral character. And he writes this in one of his books. We did not think of the great plains, the beautiful rolling hills, and winding streams with tangled growth as wild. Only to the white man was nature a wilderness. And only to him was the land infested with wild animals and savage people. To us, it was tame. Now, we might be a little uncomfortable with the term infested or, or, or savage, but the notion that the wilderness could be a tame place or that our place in the land could be tame and not wild is something very, very thought provoking. And it's true from what I've read, and I'm making a few generalizations here as I must, um, but a widespread I'd say the consensus for indigenous people in pre-contact and early contact times, the land itself was not a place that's separate from the place of humans. In fact, it was a very much human place where human beings would carefully manage that land and uh, recognize it not as unpeopled and uh, pristine. In fact, some anthropologists say that Native people describe that land as urban. Urban in the sense that once you begin to recognize that non, your non-human relations uh, are active and, and prospering and interacting with human beings. I mean, if you've ever been in the woods at night, it's not very quiet, there's a lot going on. It's an urban space. So that's something to think about. Um, I've heard this before. So I wish you to rethink the notion of wilderness as being a pristine place apart from humans. Uh, it does raise some problems, some scholars in, in uh, uh, environmentalism say, because if we think of the wilderness as a place beyond ourselves that's unpeopled and pristine, it makes us, one, uh, hold that wilderness space to an impossible standard. It will change and be, and, and be affected by human beings, as well as animals. But two, it makes us or could allow us to uh, damage the very space of our, in our own lives here you know, in this uh, so-called urban space. 
So we need, I think, to deconstruct and, and dismantle that notion of littleness itself. So here are ways of thinking about native people, their origins. In North America, saw, some scientists say native people were here between 20,000 and 100,000 years. Earliest human evidence says that we have a 27,000 year old caribou bone scraper. Uh, earliest human remains, a 13,000 year old woman found uh, on Catalina Island. Now, uh, that's interesting and important, but for native people, traditionally, in their traditional thought, native people have been here since time immemorial. The Kiowas believed that they emerged from a hollow log. The, the uh, um, Laguna people of New Mexico believe they emerged from a spring called Aguate Spring, right in their neighborhood. They can point to where they came from. Other groups believe they fell from the Pleiades or they fell from the sky. And those ideas are very important because they root native people in a cosmos, right, um, and ensure their place on the land. And these, these ideas, these narratives can exist uh, entirely in, uh, dependent or you know, interacting with scientific views of human origin. And the two can, are not necessarily contradictory in much the way that many of us might support science and also have religious views uh, on human origin. And here are some of the ideas about native place and land. I'm gonna read these off to you. And again, I'm saying to you here, uh, this is a traditional view for native people, pre-contact, early contact. Today, some native people are not, may not be hold these traditional values, right? Uh, and I'm generalizing across 500 nations in North America, so I have to do this tonight to make a, to make a point. Uh, first, a belief that invisible powers operate in the universe. The knowledge that these positive and negative powers are balanced, and so humans must seek balance and harmony in their own lives. The need for humans to respect and value life on Earth. The belief that healers can specialize in this knowledge. The understanding that one may relate to supernatural beings and powers through dreams and visions. And a recognition of the spiritual power of words and stories. The awareness that ceremony and story can unite the spirit world and the natural world. That last point there is very important because I want to emphasize tonight that it's the power of art, storytelling, visual arts that can, can, can help us find a closer relationship with the land itself, with what I like to call the planet, or can expand and deepen our sense of belonging through artistic practice. Imagine that. There's a call for the humanities in my field. I also want to say here in this moment with this, with this slide that uh, you may read this and it might sound to you like, wow, that sounds kind of new agey. And it's the problem in native studies that some of uh, the ideas drawn from indigenous uh, views uh, have been appropriated and marketed to serve um, you know, a, a wide mainstream. Um, this doesn't mean that those ideas are not in place. Everything I've read and many native people that I've interacted with over my, in, in my life Hold, hold these values. So they're, I think they're to be taken seriously and considered. I want to begin here with the bison because it's figures so central in our mind when we think about Native Americans and our environment. And often I hear students say to me that they know a few things about Native people when they come to my classroom. They say, um, you know, the Native Americans used the bison and they used every part. They didn't waste anything. And that's important to realize that Native people were very industrious and e e not, uh, efficient with uh, with the animals that harvest. More important though, is their native relationships with the bison were deep and profound beyond our imagination today in the Western world. For example, the story of the bison uh, for the Sioux people goes back to an ancient story. They'll say, told at a time when human beings could talk to animals. And two young hunters, uh, young men out hunting, uh, saw this something on a plane, on the plains, and in the, in the evening, a woman walked to them and she was beautiful. And one man said, don't go near her, she's holy. And another man tried to touch her and she struck him down and he vanished in a vapor of, of skeletal ash. Then the bison, the woman ran away and so we left and then she transformed into a bison. She visited them the next night uh, in their village and, and she was a white buffalo calf woman. And she gave the Sioux people, instructed them in all the, all the ceremony they had to do to consecrate uh, the holy pipe, which provided them a means of, of relating with the spirit world and planet Earth. And every time they'd smoke the pipe, they would reconnect themselves with the land. And when she left, she uh, was a woman, but then she transformed again into a bison. And it was that in that very important manner, beginning with a woman and her power on the land, that the Sioux people 
uh, conceive themselves as being belonging to that land in this very sacred uh, epic story of their origin and essentially about the personhood of the bison. So when we, and I'll say we, you know, when, when European Americans, uh, the Western world made their way over the plains, it became clear that the bison were central to the survival of the, of the Great Plains Native people. And many called for, and I'll say it, the extermination of Native people. And it also called for the extermination of the bison. They were thought of hand in hand because those, those folks, Sioux people and the bison were so closely together. So in 1800, there were 60 million bison. In 1889, which is the very near year of the bison population, 541, one tiny herd in Montana were able to be rescued. And from that herd, today we have 500,000 bison. So the destruction of bison, this is just one example, is a story of how we attempt to eradicate one, <laughs> one group, uh, you know, in hopes of uh, attacking the other, uh, very sadly here in this act of genocide. And most important though, when we, we eradicate a species, we are affecting the entire totality of, of interdependent life species. When the bison were destroyed, the, the uh, buffalo grass, the six feet tall red grass, that's all the plains you can read about is now almost gone. Okay, it was the bison's hooves that dug into the earth that allowed the buffalo grass to grow. And the, and the Sioux people would not follow the bison. They, would, they were more better understood as herdsmen. They would guide the bison and travel with them in a migratory route throughout the seasons. And so when we eradicated one species, we transformed an entire landscape and people. And today we look upon this and wonder why that was so necessary to replace the bison with cows. General Philip Sheridan said, he was the general of the entire West, kill every buffalo you can. Every buffalo is an Indian dog. And you should know that the one, the true way that the federal government was able to uh, force Sioux people to reservations was not through warfare. Some scholars say it could have cost a million dollars for every Native American killed in the war on the Great Plains. And instead it was through killing the bison, making them, driving them to extermination and destroying the food supply for the Sioux people, and they came into reservation started. And that's how it was done. Down farther south, the Kiowas described the loss of the bison as an ecocide, uh, because their religion is so predicated upon the bison itself and the bison people. Now I turn to this notion of the human. What is a human? Look into this picture here. These are primates. You can find this on the internet. Where are the humans? I see gorillas, orangutans, lemurs. <laughs> I don't see human beings. If you look around the internet, very often you will not, when they answer, you look for primates, you won't see human beings. Are human beings primates? Well, they are indeed. They're primates. I found this one chart. We're down at the bottom right hand corner. We see these, these human beings down here, <laughs> the hairless people. Uh, and all the rest uh, um, you know, are, are primates, but right down here at the bottom. What happened? How did we do this? What if we start calling ourselves human beings? And what has that done to us? Has that been helpful? Are we, are we the most uh, adaptive, some say intelligent primate on the planet? Did that come at an expense the way we sever ourselves from the rest of the primates? I think it's important for us to some, at some times try to find some humility and decentering ourselves as being the, uh, the leaders uh, of all life on Earth. Uh, if we are, I don't know if we're doing a very good job. How does the concept of human and non-human personhood and kinship affect our views of moral agency and ecological responsibility? I want to ask this question. I want to look at this story. Look here at this story uh, photograph uh, made by Orchie Moore Lines. Uh, and he, and he, uh, he was Onondaga chief, a uh, very important chief uh, of, the, of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. That's the Iroquois uh, in the Northeast, in New York. And when he painted this, he wanted to, to dramatize the story of Sky Woman. It's talked about all the time. For the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois, the story of their arrival on Earth begins with Sky Woman. And the story is that up in the sky world, there was a chief, a famous chief who had a daughter who's very ill. And he, in a vision, he heard that he should dig up, the, cut down this tree and put his daughter at the foot of it. And it was a tree that everyone relied upon for their food. 
And people were angry at him because he ordered the tree cut down. And they thought it was selfish to save his life at the expense of the people. But he cut up the tree down. And when he cut it, another lord was angry. He walked up, and in his anger, he kicked his, the chief's daughter. And she fell through the hole in the ground made by the tree. And she fell. And as she fell, she, let, she came down to earth. And on her fall, the earth was already here. It was the back of a turtle that rose up out of the water. And the animals flew up, the birds and the geese, and, and broke her fall and caught her and brought her to earth. And all the animals were already there. And here's you see it dramatized in this, in this wonderful painting. How many times in creation stories for native people, the world begins with the animals, and only the humans, they arrive much later. Why is that? Why do we begin with animals long before humans? And I would say through those origin stories that are told repeatedly, Native Americans traditionally have developed a notion that not just human beings, but all life, much of life, has personhood. Certainly animals, but also rocks and wind and trees and even baskets, as I said. So in my own language, in the Cherokee language, uh, it's arguable that the very notion of animal personhood is woven into our language. For example, the stem in the Cherokee language, that's the center of a word we use. The stem, for example, is geekly, right, or gili. That's at the center of, of, of other words used for that term. So gili means to uh, yo asi, to suffer. That word is used to describe a dog, gili. So enena gili, come here dog, or agili yo asi, to suffer. So why would suffering be related to a dog? It invokes a story. So uh, older people, elders in the Cherokee Nation tell the story that at one time, of ancient times, human beings could talk to animals. And there was a dog or dogs that lived beyond the village of the human beings. And they could talk to each other and the dogs were suffering. And the dogs came in slowly, creeped in in a scared manner and asked human beings if they could live with them. And the Cherokee believed that they would help them, help the dogs who were suffering. And so they invited them into the village and they've been friends ever since. So that's why we use the term deeply to describe dog. And in that term itself describes that story or invokes a story of suffering. So what should be the place of non-Western and Western spirituality in environmental knowledge and ethics? Spirituality, I want to raise that question right now. And I, I say spirituality carefully. Um, we're talking about something that's not necessarily scientific, but not necessarily can be proven. Religion, uh, other non-empirical uh, uh, knowledge we have about the world. And yet I feel that sometimes that science may not be enough to get us there. And I want to raise that question right now. So again, I'll do that with the story here. Osio, don't eat you. You guys can learn to say that. Osio, don't eat you. Hello, how are you in the Cherokee language? What are we saying? Now, many Cherokees may not know this because it's something, it's a common greeting. Uh, Osio, don't eat you. Hello, how are things fluid, peaceful, and easy with you? The concept of dohi or tohi is actually throughout our Cherokee language. For example, Toki is a Cherokee state of being in which the world is smoothly flowing, evenly and moderately paced, fluid and peaceful, as if watching the clouds, grass, uh, clouds and grass grow on a spring day. And this is from Tom Duff, and he's a widely recognized Cherokee elder and a fluent speaker of Cherokee language at Eastonville, and that's in North Carolina. And this is what Tom says. This is Toki, right? It's more than just, hey, how's it going? It's how are you being? Are you centered? Are you centered in the natural world? Are you centered in the planet? Have you thought of your place of good? Are you in harmony? Have you thought of your kinship with other non-human persons? Are you centered today? Imagine that, asking someone that in a meeting. Toby is also at the center of some words that describe certainty or truth, so truth. It's also used to describe peace and health and well-being and harmony. Toby. Now, this is a Catlin uh, portrait of, actually it's a Mandan uh, house. This is on the Northern Missouri, probably in the 1830s when George Catlin visited. And there's a, this, is a, this is a context of storytelling. Uh, the Mandan lived in earth lodges. And over here is, uh, you can see, he's, he's not a Mandan person, he's very likely a, uh, a missionary. And he's visiting, he's listening carefully to the stories. This is a context of storytelling. I want to talk about storytelling briefly. Now this is an artistic act and that's not, you know, art is hard, something hard to translate in indigenous thought because art can be, it can be uh, ceremonial, it can do all kinds of things, but it's a ceremonial act to tell a story, 
right? It's an artistic act, and it does something in the minds of the listeners, right? Look at these listeners. It does something in their minds. The story is told to confirm the world. It's not supposed to be created. It shall not lie. To lie or prevaricate would be just a, a sacrilege. It's to reveal the truth of the world as it is. It's to align the land beyond with the minds of the listeners, okay? And once that land is aligned with the minds of the temper, uh, a, a, a supreme power of well-being fills up the, the hearts of the listeners. That's the purpose of storytelling. So the oral tradition is a flexible body of knowledge through which native people make and remake the world. That's my definition of oral tradition of storytelling. And I'm, I put Raven here from the Pacific Northwest just to remind you that all over North, North America, native people tell stories still today. The most voluminous uh, amount of, of, of storytelling, of, of literature, is in the oral traditional tale to native people. This one here, uh, dramatized in the Raven in the Pacific Northwest, tells the story of how Raven came and brought light to the people. At one time, there was no light, and human beings were suffering. And Raven, he's their trickster figure and all kind of a kind of a deity. He uh, he was giant. He put on his raven skin and he flew up into the heavens. And when he got up there, he found his father, who was the sun king. And there he decided to trick the, daughter, the son's daughter. He turned himself into a willow leaf and he got into a, a bucket of water. And she drank the leaf. And when she drank the leaf, uh, raven became a little boy and she gave birth. And then a the baby that was born from her rolled around and tricked, tricked Sun King, his father, and got a hold of a box. And in the box was the May, the light. And he rolled the box around and play and tried to trick the father and then jumped to the sky hole, again, a hole in the sky, came down to earth and then yelled at fishermen and said, give me some of your fish. And he became raven again. And the fishman said, no way, we can't. And in anger, he threw the box on the ground and it burst open and light finally came out all over the earth and finally there was light. Okay, so this is a story that begins with a trickster, which is a huge part of origin stories for Native people. He, he lies, he cheats, he's irrational, he's profane. And all this is to remind us that there's a balance in the world between sacred and the profane, between truth and falsehood. And this wonderful creation figure brings us life. Okay, uh, and he had personhood. That's a very important too. So in the story too, also is the notion of mystery. And I want to underscore that. Mystery, the idea that the world is a wonderful place and can never, and maybe should never be fully disclosed. And that goes against all of our enlightenment thinking in the Western world. That is why, for example, the native people say, we don't want you to dig into our earthworks and our mounds. And scientists will say, how could you deny us access to the human story? And some native people say, it's okay, we want to accept the mark of mystery within our lives and our cultures. So I'm not coming down either way on that, and remind you, the native people tend to accept mystery in a way that some of us often don't. So should the land be valued for its use or for its intrinsic worth? And how can this tension be resolved? It's a question of value. How do we value the land? Should we, should we preserve and protect trees because they produce lumber? Or is there something deeper? Do trees have intrinsic worth? Does a tree have worth in and of itself? It's something to consider. And I, I provide this last slide, which is kind of blurry, but I wanted you to look at this because we have a teepee and a truck in the background. We have, might be a, a meeting for the Sundance for a Montana Plains tribe, maybe Blackfeet, and the beautifully decorated teepees, the people getting ready to give ceremony and acknowledge in, deep, in a deep way their relationship with the land and the past and the ancestors. And there's a truck right there, <laughs> a pickup truck that's probably spewing carbon emissions. So there's a, there's a contradiction there, maybe uh, an anachronism, but also the way of reminding us that we live in modernity and we need to find a way to exist in modernity and still recognize and, and recall uh, the traditional ways of native people, uh, not just for native people, maybe for all of us, find a way to uh, shift our consciousness and live more closely with this land and, and toward a, 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 maybe a relationship even uh, of belonging. So I want to provide a toolkit here. First, I wish you to all of us consider how we might be centered the human. It will involve, involve a process of self-reflection. Two, accept a margin of mystery. How can we do that? Do we always need to know everything and demand to know and assume the right to know? 
or is an ocean of mystery, wonder, awe, uh, thrill in living in, uh, in the planet? How could that serve us in our environmental efforts? So I describe that as connection. And then fourth, we need to immerse ourselves in creation. Right? I mean, immerse ourselves in our daily lives, not just when we get to a national park, but every day. Try to, find, to take a moment, stop, and find ourselves in a community, not just of human beings, but of all kinds of life forms of their own personhood. And I would call that community. So that's all I'm going to say right now. And now I'd like to hear from the, uh, Professor Longombardi. Thank you so much for that, Sean. Um, we can turn it over to Pam now. There we go. Uh, I thank you everyone for being here. I appreciate all your um, uh, attendance in this time right now. It's really interesting for us to see that there were so many registrars and that this conversation is really um, a vital uh, urgency right now. So um, I am going to start my screen share and then get the video rolling are my slideshow rolling and uh, tell you what I am really involved with. Um, I want to just start for a second by reminding us that we are on an ocean planet that's 70% water covered. And, um, you know, we really ought to call it ocean, I think, in some ways more than Earth, even though we are the terrestrial uh, inhabitants. And the thing that I also want to talk about is time, because we are in a time that is changing so rapidly. Um, I really, in some ways, never thought I'd live to see the day of some of the changes that have happened, even just in the past two years. And to me, that is, um, it's really thrilling to see how humans are evolving to uh, undo some of the injustices that have been perpetrated over a long period of time. But let's go back because the earth is so much older than the way we know it now. I worked in the 80s um, as a scientific illustrator for Jack Horner, a really fantastic uh, a MacArthur fellow uh, paleontologist from Shoto, Montana. And we were working on this site that he had discovered and it was an 80 million year old nesting site for a particular kind of dinosaur. And this dinosaur was fossilized in a kind of Pompeii-like um, volcanic event. So they were doing what they were doing in their dinosaur life uh, while they were killed. So it was a really, uh, you know, unprecedented opportunity to study what that what their life was like. So we dug in the field, and then during the winters, I would um, do the drawings of um, specimens. And these were hadrosaurs. And so they were um, about a 30 foot long adult um, duck build uh, dinosaur. And they actually were beach dwellers. And the thing that's really fascinating to me is that in the time uh, the, of their uh, you know, reign, it was uh, 80 million years ago. And that place in Montana was literally the beach of the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, so wrap your brains around that. It's 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 almost uncompre uncomprehensible, and it's really fascinating to to think about how the Earth has seen so many different types of life forms over that time. Uh, this was a um, a dramatization done by another artist of how they actually looked, and um, you know they had families. The thing that was really important about this site was that the dinosaurs were found with eggs. Um, hatchlings, so the ones that had just hatched, and yearlings, year old ones, in the same nest. So this became the evidence that at this point in evolutionary history, these dinosaurs were warm blooded and they were actually acting much more like a large ground nesting bird, like a flamingo. And there was evidence, of course, of parental care. And so um, we learn from this uh, record of the past the layers of the earth that exist. And this is a really beautiful drawing that um, it's not my drawing. You can look at it again on the internet if you want to try to find it, but it's, it's a beautiful dramatization of 
this long, long period of time, starting from 4 billion something or other years ago, where there was no life on the earth. And then it slowly evolved out of the ocean. We all came from the ocean originally. And time goes by and spirals up. And you know we see the uh, periods where dinosaurs are ruling um, the Jurassic. And those, those dinosaurs have also you know, moved in, into their quote, extinction, but they were very successful species for a very long time, uh, all the way up to this last slice here called the Holocene epoch. And what the scientists who study this have decided is that we are no longer in the Holocene. All of human evolution has happened in this little slice here. And what they are determining is that we have entered a new time in the history of the world, which is the Anthropocene. And we are in this period of time because what it suggests is that humans have altered the physical planet to the extent that it will show up in the future fossil record. So what we are doing actually is utilizing the previous life forms and the original source of energy was the sun. And that allowed the first algae-like creatures to come you know, into being in the ocean and um, their bones and their um, material around them, the plants and animals that lived in uh, this time period became what we have now extracted um, to make this industrial revolution that we are now um, amongst. And it is this extraction of the, uh, you know, the things that, uh, um, lived before us turned into oil that are, is powering you know, our existence now for much of the planet. And the thing that uh, I think is really fascinating, my dad, not only being a lifeguard, he also later worked for Union Carbide. And so he was in the beginning of the development of plastic. And this was an early map from uh, Life Magazine that showed that we literally have begun to uh, invent this sort of new continent uh, of plastics. And the irony of course being that there are now quote continents and I'll talk a little bit more about that of plastic in the center of the ocean. Um, so I grew up with plastic. It was, it was the new like cool uh, thing you could have um, a color coded birthday party or have you know a, a cartoon character Flintstones or Spider-Man or something. And your mom could just wrap this all together and, and toss it away. So it was convenient, it was modern, it was clean, it was new, it was the thing. And lo and behold, we never could have imagined that one day there would be this sort of haunting of that plastic coming back to us in the form of ocean plastic, which is the material that I've been working with for the past 15 years. So the very first time I saw this was in the south point of the big island of Hawaii, and it was a shock. I couldn't imagine what I was seeing. It was such a remote location there, and the uh, the earth itself was um, covered with these you know sticks and natural things, and then all of this multicolored plastic. And so I uh, immediately felt I like I was looking at a crime scene. I realized that the ocean is vomiting up this material, and once I got closer, I realized this is all of the stuff that we use every day. And then things that I don't under, even recognize um, at the time, I didn't. And that we have been treating in some ways uh, the ocean as our, our toilet. It's become the place where we dump waste. And that is something that has um, really changed the whole chemistry, the ecology, even the hydrodynamics of the ocean um, and that's the center of why we are experiencing so much climate change at the moment. When I saw this, I, I literally felt like I had to do something. And the very first thing I did was start photographing it and then taking it away. I felt like I needed to document this forensically and, and show this crime and then bring back the evidence. So first of all, I worked with um, uh, the, the nets themselves, which were, um, part of what we now really recognize as the factory fishing industry. And this is the thing that is problematic about it because the ocean is not um, a source only of 
uh, you know, seafood. It is a living interconnected ecosystem and we've emptied out so much of it at this point with these massive scale fishing um, that allows for millions and millions and millions of species that are not even the target fish that are gonna end up at the all you can eat seafood bar at Red Lobster. Um, it, the, you know, there, it's taking out all kinds of other creatures along with it and we really have created a deep problem for ourselves. Um, the other thing is there's, there are these unintentional consequences. And I think almost all of plastic, uh, once it leaves our hand, has these unintentional consequences. And of course, was, I'm sorry for these pictures. They're extremely painful for me to look at, and I'm sure they must be for you, but this is the truth of what that it takes to get the fish to market that uh, um, we often don't think about where it comes from. Uh, and it's not just hurting fish either, it's hurting all kinds of sea mammals. This seal was rescued, by the way, my friend took this photograph and they were able to get it out. But I needed to make something with that material and I first thought of making a drift web, which is a, uh, an idea of uniting a web of life uh, from the land to the sea. The nets were our predatory tool as is a spider's. And then I started looking deeper at these objects themselves. And I really, really uh, started to feel like I was looking at a kind of future archeology span and that there was messages literally coming from the ocean and that the ocean was conscious on a level that I think is very much related to um, where the way Sean was describing the indigenous belief system that it is a consciousness, it is an intelligence and it has uh, agency and it's communicating with us through these materials. So as I began to uh, work with this more and more and look at these objects, um, I began to construct them into um, forms. And uh, to me, this is the, the second greatest thing that happened to the piece that you see behind um, Kay on the screen. And, and this right here with Crystal Bridges has, acquired this piece and um, I've come to learn that it becomes a great object of discussion. And for me, there's nothing that better that art could do in terms of work in the world is to have people notice things about it that need to be um, make an adjustment, a, a correction, so to speak. And I literally believe that in some ways, um, the emerging infectious disease of plastic has really probably one of our biggest problems right now. Um, I also found these strange war toys right in the height of the uh, the Gulf, the first Gulf War, the original Iraq War, um, and that was a war about oil. So this was really my first clue that these were a, a form of communication, and not only that, that they came back from their journey through the sea, through the lives of these creatures, they came back altered, and they are now both amputees, a, a, you know, war a war in the desert for oil. And of course, these plastics are ending up everywhere. Um, and it's not even just on the sea. Of course, it's the land. So um, many, many, many creatures are being affected by this wanton, I call it vagrant plastic. Um, or artwork that I've made with this to kind of discuss these ideas um, are, one of them is Bounty Pilfered. Uh, I've made, a, a, several pieces that came directly out of the um, oil spill, uh, we call it in quotes, um, the disaster in the Gulf, uh, the Deepwater Horizon disaster. Um, that's a beach that's very close to me. It's close to my home and my heart. Um, and so all of this plastic came from Hawaii and Alaska, Costa Rica, Greece, many places all over the world. But the idea being that this we've sort of pilfered the bounty of the natural world and we've returned imitations of the natural world. Um, another piece that was related to that was the um, crime of willful neglect. And these are wall installations. Um, this particular one is about 10 feet tall and it has over 500 individual elements that I've personally picked up. Economies of scale is another um, idea about 
applying a, a kind of marketing term to uh, the bounty of the world. And um, I found it in a Trader Joe's where they had a sign next to their seafood department saying, how can we continue to offer so much delicious seafood at such low prices, economies of scale? And this to me was the, the indicator and the irony of why we are now in trouble in terms of our relationship to this ocean planet we live on. I've been all over the world doing this work and one of the most interesting places I was was in uh, Armila, Panama on the border of Colombia. This is a completely isolated location. You cannot uh, even begin to get there unless you take two boats in a plane. There are no trees, uh, there are no uh, uh, streets or roads to get to it. Um, there are no municipal services and there a most beautiful culture lives there, the Kunayala and they are um, completely autonomous. They have their own language. They have their own monetary system. They are kind of a, a matriarchy in a way because women control the money. And so um, they have a lot of power and they live in these thatched roof buildings. And because of this location and the high impact beach that it is, it's also one of the premier nesting sites in the world for the oldest living sea turtle, which is the leatherback and, and I was down there during an Arribata when they came in to do their nesting on land. They can be a thousand to 2000 pounds each and they can be up to 12 feet long and they do not function well out of the ocean. So it's a great effort for them to lay their eggs on land. She is too far up the beach. She came closer because a very well-meaning NGO had su supplied this village with their first nighttime lights. They were solar lights. And unfortunately, it completely confused the turtles because the light part of what they've evolved to know is the breaking waves of the surf. And that's what they go to at the end of the ordeal of laying these, these eggs. And so unfortunately, she made her way eventually all the way up to that um, first cabin there. And that's the chieftain's uh, house. And so what we did while I was there was to uh, make the uh, a somewhat of a solution to this problem, which was uh, to make light covers for the um, the solar lights that would be decorated because the women there are artisans and they're just absolutely beautiful um, uh, art makers. And this was the piece that I made that. Uh, really was evidence of that particular location. Um, it, it's in Latin America and the family is such an important part of their culture. So lots and lots of these pieces were um, uh, little girls toys. And then some were also, you know, trucks and, and uh, um, mobiles, you know, automobiles and things that um, the boys like to play with. So in these communities, um, I've done work sometimes that's live that literally involves the bodies of the people uh, that I'm there to, um, to work alongside. Uh, we cleaned this particular island for two weeks. This is Key Cocker in Belize. And this is actually a fairly uh, um, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a populated island. I mean, it's visited by tourists. There are some that are almost completely unpopulated but we made um, a sign that was shot by a drone and the people uh, that are, it helped us are spelling the O-R-R-Y part of the word sorry. And this was kind of an SOS, um, a projection of the fact that Belize is about three inches above uh, the tide. And you know, you're looking at the entire length of the island. It just kind of doubles behind that. So. They are very much on the front line of, of uh, climate change and sea level rise. And they were also having at that time a giant, uh, almost like um, a plague of sargassum, which is a, a type of seaweed. So that blackish stuff there is all the rotting seaweed that in the natural ocean, it literally is the cradle of all the um, newborns, fish and crabs and everybody, they all hang out in there and they hide and they can get bigger. Uh, but there was a, um, an event in the Amazon that created a, um, 
a huge surge of water that came out and uh, uh, hit a, a large industrial area and pu pushed a lot of the uh, um, fertilizers and chemicals into the water, caused this bloom of sargassum and it, it literally took the, uh, um, took its way down to these islands who rely on tourism. It was really kind of grim. Um, but I think that if we join in community and we address truly this kind of mess that we've made, um, then we have a chance. That's what gives me hope. It gives me hope every single day when I go to places and I see people are willing to literally lay down um, first of all, work extremely hard and then lay down in the sand. Each one of those people is squirming a little because they're getting bitten by ants <laughs> long enough to make this uh, visual piece of artwork and um, to let people know, at least at, if it's not uh, to the people on this planet, it could be to a future life form that we become that there were people paying attention when we were entering, I think the most, um, mercurial and changing point in our life uh, and really one of those strongest points of uh, change of the entire planet. So um, the mass extinction just refers to the sixth mass extinction which we are now in presently and um, the fifth one was the dinosaurs. So how do we go from here? I think nature will be fine. It will twist and turn itself into something new. Um, where does that leave us? I'm just going to um, move past these ones and I welcome anyone that would like to uh, talk to me. Um, you can get my contact number from my website, driftersproject.net. And um, just to say that we are all in this boat together and not only ourselves, but the uh, more than human world that lives here with us, we're all earthlings together. And whether we save ourselves in time and whether we can make a shift that is required, um, that's to be seen. I am extremely hopeful and I will bend down for the millionth time and pick up that piece of plastic because I know that that one piece of plastic will not be harming or killing any other creatures. And uh, that is an idea that spreads. So yes, art can transform things. Art can change the world. And I really do believe that with all of my heart. And from there, I would like to switch into our discussion, which uh, I'm really excited about this because Sean and I have gotten to know each other a little bit in the um, act of putting all of this together. And so, um, I was really curious when Sean was talking about the dog and being, uh, you know, it, embedded within the word of suffering, and um, that it was him emerging from suffering that brought really, you know, the the early dog into the human life and became this companion and beloved creature to us. Do you have a dog, Sean? <laughs> I think you're still muted. Growing up, we always had dogs. Always yeah. Had, we had, I could tell you dog stories all day. Uh, we, when I was a kid, we had a St. Bernard and uh, she had, back then it was okay to have litters of puppies. And, uh, you know, she had a litter of puppies one time and she, uh, she had all her puppies, and St. Bernard's have big litters, and she had all her puppies with her. And then um, one morning they were gone. And my mother came outside the backyard and just chastised Brandy. That was her name. Where are your babies? What did you do with your babies? You get out of here and you go get those puppies right now. And she left the yard and she went on to where she went, but she came back with like nine or 10 puppies. <laughs> The dog stories are exciting because I think human beings have this kind of ancient kinship with that animal and you know, it's something uncanny about it. And it gets us in touch with the natural world. It doesn't go quite far enough because we've got to get out there, I think, and, and have respect for animals that we don't entirely know or trust, but would be thought even dangerous. 
Um, but uh, dogs are a nice place to start. You know, another thing I must say too is that this, it's a cultural uh, difference sometimes, but if you ever go to a reservation, you'll see dogs everywhere. I mean, dogs all over the place. And uh, you know, they won't be on leashes and often they won't have names. And sometimes people will think, what's going on around here? Why can't you folks put your dogs on leashes? And, you know, <laughs> and the truth is those dogs have a lot of personhood, so much so that they can't really be named or controlled with a leash. Mm -hmm. A lot for a lot of native people, uh, native communities. So yeah, dogs, dogs are pretty exciting. And like I said, a lot of these stories, if you read them carefully and, and listen to elders, they'll begin by saying this was an ancient time when human beings and animals could talk to each other. Well, I, I actually still feel like we can. Um, <laughs> it's really interesting, but um, uh, Rupert Sheldrake is a, uh, he was a, uh, you know, a regularly trained uh, empirical Western scientist. And he was really getting tired of the ideas that everything had to be proven by science and it took a long time because you had to replicate the exact conditions and make that uh, change or event or you know uh, experiment repeatable. And he left that completely and he started working with the bane of uh, the scientific world, which is the anecdote, you know, the personal story. And he started to become really interested in how people uh, would relate to their dogs. And he did this study really based on hundreds and hundreds of people where they would set up a camera uh, within their home um, and they were gone for the day and they were coming home from work. And the dogs, many, many, many of them would be already waiting at the door. And so what he decided to dig into was how did, why were they there? You know, did they hear the car coming down the road? Was it the same time of day? And all of those things slowly, he dismantled them and um, found that the dogs actually are experiencing a form of telepathy with their owners. It's because we're connected by the morphic field, which are these you know, strands of energy that really, I think they're, they're what we could call love, that they're connection and that dogs have that with their um, humans. And so, he, he found out that oftentimes the dogs were not only aware and going to wait for the owner when they were getting in the car at work and leaving, but even that they had started to notice because they had the times lines synchronized, right? So the person who was doing this experiment for him uh, would note when they you know, decided they needed to leave. And often it was before they even reached their car, just the idea of uh, getting in their car to go home that the dog was then alerted. So uh, I think there is something to be said for that. And it, it is, um, you know, a lot of people are uncomfortable with that sort of mystical aspect um, of, of the world, but I really do feel we live in a mystical universe. And I think there is something that, you know, we, we are not able to explain with Western science. And so that's how I, I really do think about um, our relationship to animals if you let that happen. Yes, Pam. Uh, that's why I put that, I mean, I took a risk. I felt my presentation by uh, mentioning the, the mystery, uh, accepting a, a margin of mystery in our world. And, uh, and I know for, for indigenous people, Many indigenous people I've talked to over the years, much of in my reading, and that's that's not a problem at all. But we live in an age right now, a precarious moment, where we're wondering, uh, worried about the respect for science um, and the problem of disinformation uh, and, and thought that's not you know founded in science, fact. And yet, and that's why I feel like I was taking the risk in saying this. I mean, I feel sometimes that science alone won't fully connect us with the natural world or with the planet. There has to be something more, like you say, uh, I don't want to call it love, uh, friendship, a uh, sense of awe, mystery, wonder, uh, an acceptance of the uncanny, the unknown. Uh, something's going to get us connected with the non-human world if we're ever going to really love it enough to protect it. 
Yeah, and I, I really do think that, um, you know, I think the creatives, the people like us that are, are working in the world um, in metaphoric ways, in um, symbolic ways and physical real ways, of course, too, but we utilize those things as tools, right? So, you know, that the earth was a turtle, you know, a tur the earth is the back of a turtle. And um, I love the, the vision that there is this giant turtle and I'm sitting on a little part of her shell, but uh, you know, also it, it could be, it could be a metaphor for something that, you know, yes, the animals were here first, right? So when I think about this stage that we're in and um, being a person coming from, I have a scientific background as well. I, uh, I have a degree in biology and I, uh, and uh, the natural sciences. And I got a teaching certificate to teach science. So I, I, I literally uh, respect that, but I think it's, it's a synergistic thing. Like, I think that we can have the, uh, you know, the, the left side of the brain is activated by the alphanumeric knowledge. And that's really a science-based kind of place. And the right side of the brain is where, uh, you know, creativity and flow sort of comes. So if you, navigate that through the heart of the activist and you know, we've got this sort of triangulation that really I think can make us whole and can make us able to um, address these grave problems that we're in. Uh, I think the, the world needs all of its artists right now. I think we need out of the box thinking, we need creativity, we need a new way of doing things and you know artists have done that from you know the beginning of time. We know how to make something out of nothing. Um, we we know how to take an idea and manifest it. And so those things are, you know, those are what we need, I think, now more than ever. And um, you know, in a way, it's 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 to undo a kind of one-sided form of development um, that we've taken, which is, you know, I, I could call it the extractive mentality. Um, where you know everything is here to be taken and used by humans, and to the detriment of all of us, including uh, you know the humans, because we are you know we have to share. <laughs> we don't seem to have remembered that somehow. Yeah, I, I was amazed when I saw the, the sea tortoise uh, in your slide there in Belize or in Panama. Um, so I was thinking of the you know Turtle Island when I saw it. Massive turtle. Uh, you know, I've done some work in Belize in, in a study abroad program. And uh, mm. uh, yeah, I was thinking, you know, about what you said. Um, at least there right now, they still have a very a sizable, uh, healthy manatee, manatee population. Yes. In Florida, it's, it's, from what I hear, it's utterly in peril. And it's just, it's terrifying. I mean, for, you know, at least for young people now, there's an emotional response to what's happening to our planet. And it's, it's a, it's a feeling of despair and helplessness. I mean, the animals feel it way, certainly, but young yeah. human beings are, are feeling this way too. And so we've, we've got to find a way to, uh, to give people hope and, and enable them to take a, a action. That's why I was thinking of you know, a different way of looking at ourselves in the land and, or on the planet. You know, I say planet because you know, land's not enough, right? We, I mean, indigenous people thought themselves in a totality. I mean, when we look at the stars and navigate by them, and, and, and the stars are alive, and people would tell stories about the cosmos. And then, of course, they wrecked, you know, hundreds of thousands of indigenous earthworks throughout North America, which were often aligned with the stars and the lunar calendars, you know. So, I mean, the native ancestors, they were, they were deeply enmeshed in our land. I mean, on all of it, the totality, and not just in, uh, you know, with, with, uh, with the animals, as we say. I don't think the term animal would come up much. <laughs> I, think yeah, I, I agree 100%. And, um, you know, uh, I mean, I you know, back to the dog, I think that is why, um, you know, right after 9-11, I have lots of friends in New York and visit it quite regularly. And all of a sudden, you started to see all of these very small dogs, companion animals um, with people on the streets. And I think after the horror of, of um, living through, you know, that catastrophe, um, they needed 
you know, something that was just like a bundle of love. And, you know, the small apartments people live in, you know, they all seem to go for smaller dogs. And um, I think that was, you know, I heard a correlation also um, during uh, the beginning of the pandemic that there was just this huge rise in um, people getting companion animals for the first time. And so in a way, they're the emissaries uh, for us to understand something about um, the parts of the world that we are not smart enough to understand. I mean, they have, they have superpowers that we don't have. Um, you know, there's lots and lots of stories about elephants, uh, you know, moving to higher ground um, on the advance of the tsunami. Uh, also, you know, another amazing thing during that tsunami, um, uh, a baby hippo was orphaned and it was befriended by a big turtle and they were just buddies and that that turtle understood that this was a baby that was lost and traumatized and it became its companion and you know to me that just makes my heart like burn with joy because you know those are the stories and the lessons i think we need to understand um and i think somehow you know almost like covid was a wake up call for that um I noticed that people started to be um, a little more delicate with each other, not as quick to tempers. Um, I think we realized that we were in a fragile place and that was a really important thing for the human world to understand. You know, it is all fragile and it has to be cared for and protected. And, and we are it too, it's all of us. Yeah, and we're often surprised to see uh, interspecies friendship. You know, for human beings, like what? You know, we, we can think of dogs, domesticated animals, but you know that you know when you see video footage, and I've seen this video footage of a coyote hunting with a badger. And mm -hmm. they, the coyote is fast; he can hunt down you know the, the groundhog, and then the badger can dig. And, yeah, and I've seen video footage of, of these two animals going out at night to hunt, and they're in it. Uh, maybe we're anthropomorphizing, but but you know the, the badger and the coyote are kind of you know, sniffing each other, and they're very happy, and excited to run to a culvert where that yeah. gets captured by a game camera. And I, I want to bring up a guy that I think everybody should know about, who is an amazing naturalist and writer, Carl Safina, yeah. because he's written a recent book called Inside the Animal Mind, something along those lines. Carl Safina is S A F I N A. But um, the reason I know him quite well, I was on an expedition with him and I've known him now for um, almost a decade. And he literally is one of the first, you know, PhD trained scientists who will start to talk about the fact that, you know, this, this term anthropomorphized uh, is really not helpful to us anymore. And if you see something that looks like happiness, it's happiness. Uh, you know, dogs and other creatures do smile. And, you know, I think that's another way that we've made this wall of separation or something between uh, ourselves and uh, the, the more than human world. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's a really, it's a really profound book. And, um, you know, Jane Goodall knew that, of course, right from the beginning, you know, she, she saw right away the kinship between humans and our, you know, nearest relative chimpanzees. Um, uh, Pam, you mentioned you mentioned flow, and, and I, I was thinking of two things. First, the idea of Tohi in the Cherokee worldview of, of flow. Are you in the flow? Um, mm -hmm. That flow is like a current of all that ugly plastic flowing to us, you know, that washes up on the beach and in Hawaii, reminding us that we're all connected for better or for worse. Mm hmm. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, I think, um, and I've been dealing with plastic for a very long time. Um, you know, I didn't even realize in the beginning uh, of my childhood when my dad would bring experiments home from, you know, work and show us what they were making in the lab, you know, two things poured together into a drum and it foams out. And, you know, that was like the birth of expansion foam, you know, foam insulation, great stuff that 
what a name, right? Um, anyway, that you know that uh, I I have started to shift my understanding of um, how to think about it as a material, and that uh, and this is I think really important because this is a problematic material, and it, it's problematic in the way that we've handled it. Because in other ways, it's it's useful. I mean, it can be, but I think it's more of a um, physical solid form made of our uh, probably our one of our you know uh, worst character traits, which is um, you know greed and uh, overconsumption, and you know that's not something that is. Uh, prevalent in societies that live a little closer to nature, you know? So, so anyway, I, I've begun to think of it, okay, so now this plastic is goes from our hands and goes out in the world and it engages with all these creatures and gets bitten by all them and, and uh, some things grow on them and make their home and then they move through the ocean and then it comes back on the beach and we can read that. And so now it's become a messenger. It can literally provide us with um, information. It's a mirror to us. It's a mirror to this invisible world out there. And so um, why don't we start looking for these clues and, and really use it as a, a moment to stop getting new stuff and find it, you know, find it on the beach and let it tell you its story and um, utilize it that way as a tool. Well, maybe we should transition now to our activity. How does that sound? Okay, let me put up a share screen here with an activity. Okay, let me begin with a word here, a term we often see around road trip. And I just like to go to the dictionary. So the Merriam-Webster dictionary defines road trip as a noun. One, the remains of an animal that has been killed on a road by a motor vehicle. Two, one that falls victim to intense competition, as in political road trip. Now, you're all welcome to chuckle in the second definition. <laughs> but it does raise the question of why animals in the first definition are not considered victims or part of a competition. Now, I may be reading into that. I tend to do that uh, as a, a literary scholar. But we don't really think of animals as victims, uh, certainly not in this definition, uh, as by a, a road by a motor vehicle, and certainly not part, part of the competition. So in fact, I, have, uh, I teach a poem by an indigenous poet that writes about road, what we call road kill. And it's very sad. It's a very emotional response to the death of an animal on the side of the road. And it raised the question for all of us is how would we could become desensitized, many of us, to the death of animals at our, at our expense, I mean, from us. Um, you think back the time when we had horse and buggy or just horses or on foot, the animals were okay. They could survive when they crossed the trail. Today, we master technology to such an extent that we go so fast that they cannot keep up with us. They lose in that competition. Uh, and I would say they do fall victim. So well, down where I live in Arkansas, uh, some people have been referred to the death of, a, of, a, of an armadillo as a, a Texas speed bump or an Arkansas speed bump. And uh, still think it disturbs me. Years ago, I was riding in a car with a Native American friend and I was getting to know her. And every time she passed um, an animal that fell victim on the side of the road, she'd raise her hand in prayer. And she never stopped doing it throughout my entire time in that region. So roadkill, something we need to consider to think about the way we desensitize ourselves to the animal world and the planet. Another slide I want to show is this one. Now, you're also free to laugh. You know, eat more chicken, Chick-fil-A. It's all over the bulletin, billboards, you know, on the internet. Uh, people find it funny. And it's cute, but it does give me pause. Uh, the cows are saying eat more chicken and they can't write very well. Uh, they don't have a great deal of literacy. Uh, they're struggling to defend themselves. They've got sandwich boards on, like someone who's walking down the street advertising 
something, right? It's, this is a campaign. And they're young cows, it looks like. And they're trying to trick us or, or talk us into eating more chicken uh, so that they can survive. And when we see cows in this, these are, I think, milk cows. But we get the point, right? These cows are to be eaten. And today, uh, for better or for worse, we generally don't want to see the meat that we eat. We used to see at a steakhouse and we have a cow perched on top of the steakhouse. We don't do that anymore. Um, people generally don't want to see the meat anymore. It's been abstracted and put into packages and colored in cellophane. Um, if you go to a European market, you'll see the meat hanging, but not in the U.S. it seems. Uh, and that's, again, a more humane way of relating to animal products, but it also may be a way to uh, allow us to eat more meat by extracting us from the, the life that lived and died uh, so that we could eat it. Uh, so many people are saying now that were we only to give up animal products, meat, but also dairy products, uh, we might stave off the destruction of rainforests in the Amazon. And some have argued that when the Amazon finally collapses, that is the beginning of the world. So I put this question to you. Toward a new consciousness and exercise. Take a few minutes to write a reply to the following questions. And we'll begin with this first question. Describe a time when you saw an animal as a person. How would this view of animals change your daily life? So take a few minutes to answer this question. And if you like, you can write your answer in the chat box. Okay, should we answer the question? Should we talk about this first question first? We're getting, we're getting some comments. Okay, this is really good. Okay, uh, someone writes, um, first the person wrote Highway Harvest, Christopher. And I think that's a, a clever um, and, and actually more complex way of thinking about um, this, this sad, um, with, destruction of animals on the highway. Um, you may not know this, but for many states, it's against the law to harvest an animal that's been hit by a vehicle. Um, I guess the logic being that would lead people to want to deliberately hit animals in order to harvest them. Um, but uh, others feel that this would be actually more, more um, humane and respectful way of dealing with the death of an animal that was actually to, to harvest it and eat it. So highway harvest uh, might be taken seriously. Um, someone else wrote, uh, I had to perform a mercy killing of a poor deer on the roadside. It hurt my heart and I apologized to it for human carelessness. I had just gone to a human funeral and it made me feel similar. Yeah, the uncanny moments we've been talking about in relation to the animals. Um, you know, and I'm not going to be here bleeding hard here about, about animal rights, but, but uh, you know, I think that all of us, I would like to state my personal opinion, which I don't normally do in the classroom. Um, but we might relate differently to animals if we knew where, where they were uh, taken and the way they lived and the way they died for us, for our food. It might really shift that consciousness the way I've been talking about. And another question here is, my dog seems like a person to me every day 
in his dependency of the independence, also the companion, companionship and emotion each other. Yeah. Um, I think it was argued somewhere in history that animals don't feel pain. <laughs> I think uh, recently, my, in my childhood, I was told that fish don't feel pain when you touch them. And I don't think that's true. Yeah. I think animals have a whole range of emotions. Okay, someone else said, I'm thinking of the short little books and how I saw a different side of mice when I was little. There were creatures to be trapped and killed. They, ro uh, they rode motorcycles. <laughs> yeah, I guess the camp, the Pam's uh, point about uh, that it might be permissible to anthropomorphize animals um, and have them acknowledge their, their personhood. You know, they say, oh, they're like us. Well, we might be like them, right? Just as easily. That's a great point. And then you here, seeing fear in a deer's stance reminds me of the vulnerability you often experience. Yeah. I know deer are very, uh, just about everywhere. You know, you see deer all the time, uh, like raccoons or whatever. Uh, I live out in a pond and, um, you know, I might go outside at night and the deer are out there and they know that at night it's safer, right? So they, they're very close to me. I look at them and uh, they look at me and I think sometimes, you know, they spend all their life, all their time trying to survive, you know, running from coyotes in our backyard. Um, so they probably are very, they pay a lot of attention to what's around them. They probably know me. I don't know them, but they probably know me really well. They know the sound of my voice. They know when I'm outside. You know, so uh, again, about that kinship, and it's kind of urban. We start thinking about the way we interact with animals all over the when we get out in the woods. Uh, someone said it can be overwhelming to acknowledge the personhood of the animals around us because there is so little room in our culture to actually uh, actualize that recognition. And, and Chris, it's so true. Um, you know, we are at, in, 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 a, in a precarious position. It's almost paradoxical. Human beings are the most adaptable animal on the planet. We were able to invent a name for ourselves. We're not primates, we're humans. Uh, and we're able to, um, you know, in this technology to serve all our needs to make our environment so comfortable to the point where I heard recently at the orthodontist for my son that we are not growing our wisdom teeth anymore. This is happening very fast. I have my wisdom teeth. And they, the, the orthodontist said that uh, new studies show that human beings just aren't using those teeth to grind up things, you know, chew on sticks. And so we are adapting so fast in some ways to be uh, uh, dangerously removed from our environment. Right? That's why we get uh, allergies nowadays are so in, in, in intense because our built environment is so tightly sealed from the world. Uh, it's a really great point. Uh, I was not trying to be glib about highway harvest. I process animals hit by cars, so it's not wasted. I hear you. You're doing, you're doing a good work, Chris. Uh, when I was about eight or nine, my grandmother had a cat whose kittens were taken by a predator. That cat super, uh, was super sad for weeks. She was a very vocal Siamese, so she made her sadness known quite loudly. Some of members of our family saw kittens as disposable and a problematic often drowning them. But my mother, and by extension, I knew that cat was a mother who loved her babies. Yeah, that's a little, a little sad in that story. I hear you. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next question and see what we have. I got one more question for y'all. Okay. This is just a picture of, of, of planet Earth. Now, let me say something. I don't know if you know this, but in the 1960s, there was a scientist named, named Lovelock, and, and I think it's J.T. Lovelock, uh, theorized uh, when he saw, he was on the coastline of um, Ireland, and he saw this, this fog path coming at him, and he didn't know what it was, and he realized after a while he tested it, it was smog coming from the continent, from, you know, from, from the, uh, France. And in that moment, he had this, this idea that the Earth was connected, and it might even be, which he later said, was a massive self-regulating organism. And we call it the Gaia hypothesis. And that Gaia is the Greek goddess of Mother Earth. And that's why I put this picture up here. Is, is it possible that the Earth is so connected that it's a massive self-regulating organism in the way that Campbell even said that it might be conscious? What would it change? How would it change our thinking about the Earth if we believe that? And the way that many indigenous people do, I believe. So if you viewed the entire Earth as alive, how would this perception change your daily life? I'd like to see some comments in the chat box.
we wait another minute or so for responses in the chat. And um, if uh, that might be a, an unwieldy question, it might be kind of tough. It's a tough one for me. Uh, we can go on to the Q one. One sort of person said, maybe I would think more about how Earth could really die. Well, that's a terrible, scary thought, right? Um, we want the Earth to live forever. Well beyond us, well beyond my generation, to my children's generation. We'll begin our Q&A. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, Christopher says, in the Bible, God, where God so loved the world, the Greek, the Greek word is cosmos, meaning he didn't just care for people, but all creation. We are part of the cosmos and not independent from Mother Earth. Yeah, that's a great point, Christopher. You know, um, I I wanted to go back to the concept of, you know, that um, the person brought up by saying that we think more about how the earth could really die. And um, I really do believe that, uh, you know, we are in a stage of our evolution as creatures, as beings, as, you know, residents of the earth with lots and lots of other creatures and, and amazing life forms. And um, we might be in, you know, in sort of evolutionary turn, you know, we might be at that moment where we do have a few minutes before the door slams shut to um, make these changes that are going to, uh, you know, kind of reverse the damage that we've done. And, you know, that that's my hope, you know, that's kind of how I like to think about it. But even if it turns out that the human species, as we call it, Homo sapiens, the wise being, uh, was not so wise after all, and maybe we were a kind of maladaptive stage of whatever a human might be. Uh, I think that nature is going to twist and turn that into something new, and that we will, you know, whether it's human or not, or something else. I think you know, it's still the same energy. It's still the same life force um, that could be perhaps better suited. So um, to that person who has that thought, um, I really strongly believe that there is a force that's pow more powerful than, than even our destructive abilities and self-destructive abilities. But, um, and that, you know, this, this force is like the most massive creativity you could ever imagine. And that it is literally an elastic energy that can transform itself into something else. We have seen that time and time again through the evolution of life on this planet. So um, I don't know if um, we'll be turning this into a cold, dark planet. I certainly hope not, but I actually don't believe that. I think that um, there is a, a stronger force than, than we are and that, you know, we'll come out the other side maybe looking different, but uh, it will still be, you know, Earth. Thank you so much, Pam and San. I want to give um, the audience an opportunity to ask a couple of questions. So if you would like to engage with our speakers tonight, please throw your questions in the Q&A um, and we will take as many as we can before we wrap up the conversation. We also want to invite you to raise a hand if you would like to share your question um, directly with our speakers tonight. So we have one question in our Q&A. Uh, thank you for this wonderful event. Pam, can you say something about how your work comes out of your background as a painter? Hmm, I love that question. Um, I am a painter who utilizes um, unusual materials. I, I often make my paintings on copper with uh, the chemicals that interact with it and change it. So the patinas that um, uh, are cold application patinas and they 
Um, and so I paint with this substance where I feel like in some ways, all of, all of these, these things and these processes are the stand in for um, nature, right? And then I come in after that, I've created this sort of, you know, vast landscape and uh, use um, different kinds of materials, a lot of industrial materials, um, manufactured materials, oil paint is obviously manufactured, um, but sometimes, uh, you know, resins or epoxies and, and I, I used to kind of keep them separate because it was always about every time I made a move with some other kind of material on that natural copper with its processed patinas that it would um, be like paving over paradise, you know, from the Joni Mitchell song. It would, it would never, I could never turn it back, right? I could never turn it back to what it was. So I had to make those moves very strategically. And then over time, uh, I just started pouring all of it together and just making this massive explosion, which seemed more like, not a literal explosion, but a, a kind of battle between these different incompatible substances. And eventually they settled into something. And then from that, I try to, um, to pull out the vision of this, um, this world that's um, the product of um, this kind of battle between the natural and the manufactured. And that's how I see the plastic too. Literally, it, uh, it, it is a manufactured object that engages in the natural world in such a way that it, it, it becomes um, a journeyer and a messenger. You know, in some ways, it could be the vehicle that uh, the ocean is using um, the way a, a, a tribe would use a shaman to go out into the unknown and that the ocean is actually using that as a, a tool for communication because the plastic is something we understand because we've made it. And so um, I think somehow that, I don't know if that answered your question, but some, somewhere between those things, I think there's this, this, this place that we're sitting right now and we can learn from um, these things that we've made in the past and reshape the world into um, this, a transformation. Great, we have a second question. I tried giving up plastic and buying food but I couldn't really do it. How do we get the corporations to stop creating so much plastic? I, um, I can start off and Sean probably has thoughts on this too, but uh, I really think that um, you are doing the right thing for the, from the first step because you're not seen as a person so much to um, the big plastic manufacturers as a consumer. And um, so, whatever you consume, you know, means that you're kind of voting with your dollars or lira or uh, euros. And, and so what you buy really sends a signal um, to the manufacturing world that this is a desired product. And, and so when people started this awareness, which is now it's, it's, it's been shaped so big that I, I can't even imagine that it would happen in such a short time, uh, the 15 years that I've been working with this stuff, uh, that people know now about the toxicity of it and they don't like the fact that they were fooled and lied to um, with the plastic was safe and modern and all of the things that you know was were sold to us in the beginning and so I think that uh, um, as you uh, start becoming more and more aware and educating yourself and then also educating everyone you know taking the opportunity with you when you bring your own bag to the store, uh, just for one second to, you know, when they, the clerk might start to put it in a plastic bag, just to say why you don't want that plastic bag. And, um, you know, it might take a minute to just, to just put the thought in their mind that, um, you know, this really isn't a, a good thing at all. And um, you might find, a, you know, in a restaurant when you refuse your straw, I think all you need to say is, have you seen that video of this turtle? And, you know, most people will be right on the phone. Um, and that, that poor turtle became um, in some way the poster child of why a single object that we can get rid of easily and unnecessary. I mean, there's not a problem, you know, when we don't need a tool besides the container um, to drink something. So um, I think that it's, 
it's actually these little steps, you know, these kind of small, low hanging fruit, individual decisions day by day that can accumulate and they are accumulating. And um, I think at some point it's going to reach that tipping point where, boom, the public refuses. It's happening all over the world. There is no single use disposable plastic allowed in France after a certain date. They have to, you know, diminish the supplies that are out there. So, uh, you know, it's going to take a minute, but um, it's happening right now before our eyes. And I think any little thing you can do is, is a big help because it becomes something that inspires someone else. And, and you, you feel good about doing that. You know, it makes you feel good when you know that that thing that you could have had and made garbage in your yard and later in the landfill and later in the ocean is not going to be touched by you because you refused it. And uh, yeah, I think you're doing absolutely the right thing. And, you know, don't get discouraged because there's lots and lots of people working really hard on this and you can be one of them too. Let your uh, elected officials know how much you care about it. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Pam. Uh, we have another question in the chat. How do you suggest we invite young people to get involved with sustainability and nature? Well, Sean does that all the time. Um, do you wanna, do you wanna? Sean, don't forget to unmute. Sorry, I'll say it over again. I get schooled by young people all the time. And that's what I love about being a professor, being around young people and, and their new ideas. It's a, they're a different generation. I mean, they, uh, you know, they all the time will be talking to me about, about the problem of plastic, about not just not just the plastic, but but the uh, like I said, the uh, the consciousness that all this uh, needed needed to shift, and um, and they're aware too that that it's, that the, the daily practice is a, a huge effort. It's very important. It makes like you say, Pam, all of us feel better about it. Keeps us aware on a daily basis about the difference we make in the world, whether good or bad. But they also are aware too that um, the, the institutions must change we can make to make lasting change uh, on our planet uh, you know in the way that um, probably the greatest intellectual of our time Noam Chomsky said that we'll never make lasting change until we change the institutions themselves so so long as for example so long as corporations and their money is considered free speech in our voting process and our 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 <laughs> Our officials are beholden to them and not us. We're not going to make that lasting change. Something as simple, not simple, but something as pivotal as campaign finance and getting corporations out of the voting process, uh, that itself would be just earth shattering. Right? How do we do that? That's another question. But it's going to have to happen, I believe, from the ground up. From, at our this level, the people. Uh, Maybe not in the streets, but maybe on the beach. That, that, that's how it's going to happen is with this young generation. So um, I know my students hate to hear this, and I, I feel terrible uh, when I say, you know, it's in your hands. You know, we, we, my generation uh, was not as, as woke, and I'll use that seriously as you all. Um, and it's in your hands, and we support you, and, and, and we're very proud of you. Thank you, Sean. I don't believe, let me see if we have one. Any more questions in the chat? I do not believe that we have any more questions at this time. Any last thoughts to either of our speakers for the evening? Pam or Sean, any thoughts? Last words. I just wanted to uh, to tell the pan the audience that um, I put in a link in the um, chat box to Plastic Pollution Coalition, which is a global uh, coalition, a group of organizations that are fighting plastic pollution all over the world, and they have lots and lots of toolkits on there for educators. Um, you know, how to work with uh, actionable steps for students, 
right in the classroom, right in the school. And um, also for communities, um, a lot of um, uh, information about young mothers and how to, you know, sort of prevent that problem from entering your baby's body, uh, you know, through the plastics. So there's, they've really done an, a major, they actually just won the Mother Teresa Sustainability Award for their work. So I think that you'll find that um, tons of information there and anyone can join it and then you get information through their uh, news feeds and whatnot. Thank you, Pam. We have one last question for Sean in the Q&A. Sean, is the difference between place and space significant for indigenous people you spoke about? Well, there's a saying that when, when story meets land, place is created. And, and that is true. I think that once we begin to tell stories about who we are and the land itself and our relationship to it, we do come to belong to that land in a process that we might even call it indigenizing. But the notion of space is quite different. Uh, that's something that's the totality all around us, not just the land and the animals, but as I alluded to in my, my, my words, uh, that includes the whole cosmos. That includes you know, the stars, uh, all, all of this, that's, that's space. Um, and, um, and I think it's, it's important to think of that totality uh, when, we, when we think about our place, not only in the land, but the planet, but also the universe. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's cosmic. <laughs> so it's very important to, to really th th think of these large thoughts and imagine the, the very, on the one hand, the paradox, right? How infinitesimal we are as human beings. And on the other, the incredible, irreversible impact we're making on this planet and, and the galaxy itself. And yeah, so that's that's a very that's a wonderful question. Um, I want to say in my final words uh, to you all and Pam, uh, and this is in a very real sense a very unique uh, panel we have here. Uh, well, often we talk about you know the impact of, of plastic on the environment or you know the planetary crisis we're in. We tend to want to go to the scientists, and I support that idea through and through. Uh, I think this is a time for relying on social, on, on, on historical facts, on scientific facts, when we start to problem solve and, and find our way out of this crisis. On the other hand, like I said, it may, we may have to look more closely at the artists and, and their, their creative response to our predicament. Um, that, in a, that alone, at the very least, will give us the uh, emotional fortitude and vision and imagination to see our way through. But it also can really serve the scientists. I really truly really believe this. Um, if you ever read the structure of scientific revolutions, Thomas Kuhn, he talks about the notion of hunches among scientists, you know, um, conducting inquiry in a way that's not always so wedded to science. Uh, that's the place for art and the artistic response. That's a place for storytelling. That's a place for uh, imagining um, and, and um, growing ourselves in the mystery of the planet, right? As, as, we, as, we, uh, as we look at the hard facts uh, to seek solution. So this is a very unique panel, very very emotional to me, very emotional and important response to the planetary crisis we find ourselves in. So thanks everyone. I did wanna um, just also thank um, the organizers that Crystal Bridges for doing such an amazing job with um, the lineup of the, the speakers tonight, um, the diversity right in this little unit of five uh, that is on the panelist side. So I wish we could see you all in the audience um, because that would be also thrilling. But uh, you know, it's not really that hard to do as long as you just you know take that first step and and uh, realize that. Um, we do have agency over our future. And um, it has a lot to do with inclusivity. And, uh, and I would throw in our fellow earthlings, um, the, the more than human world. Thank you so much. <laughs>